uh, because it's holidays, we're also uh, still pausing our league series. So can you open your Bibles with me? We jump into the Old Testament this morning. Uh, Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27 is where we'll be this morning. And once you find it, please keep it open, uh, even when we finish the reading. I'm going to read from verse uh, 5 to 17 there. Proverbs chapter 27. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. One who is full loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, everything is uh, everything bitter is sweet. Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Be wise, my son, and make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for an adulteress. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning, will be counted as a cursing. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's hand. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. This is God's word. Well, with the reading that we had earlier, I think uh, which Andrew had read for us, I mean, we get a lot of uh, verses in Scripture, a lot of promises that hit home to us, promises that we cling to. You may have your favorite, I may have my favorite, uh, but I think there is one promise that uh, nearly reaches to the top of the mountain peak for all of us, and that was what Andrew had read uh, earlier for us. Jesus said, Of my sheep, no one will snatch them from my hand. And my Father, who is greater than all, no one will snatch them from his hand. There's a a double lock there. This is a a glorious promise, I mean, for our security, for our protection, uh, assurance for us for we don't know what tomorrow may bring. And yet this wonderful promise may be it can be grossly misunderstood by people who claim to be Christians and people who are genuinely Christians. What does it it look like for God to keep us in his hand? What does it look like for Jesus to keep us in his hand to the end? What does that actually look like? I fear maybe not much thought is actually given to us. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to keep you in my hand and no one's going to snatch you, maybe we just think, well, there's some kind of invisible force field that is spiritual surrounding me. And and this, this barrier goes with me wherever I go. Or maybe even worse, the promise is taken in this way. No matter what I do, no matter where I go, no matter what path I take, I'll still be in his hand. I honestly, I genuinely believe that verse there, that no one will snatch us from Christ's hand, that the truly born-again Christian will be kept until the final day by the power of God. But we have to ask the question, how does he keep us in his hand? I mean, we could ask the question, answer in another way with the question, how does God save people? Now, we know that salvation belongs to God. I can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. How does he do it? Well, God is the one who saves, but he uses means, doesn't he? He doesn't just click his fingers and say, now you, now you believe, now you repent, and then it just happens. No, he uses means. He might use a sermon that's preached. 
He might use a conversation that you have with a friend at a cafe where they start talking to you about God. You might hear a song that's filled with the gospel. There's many ways that he does this, a track that's passed to you. And it's the same way when it comes to God keeping us in his hand. It's not just some invisible force field, this spiritual barricade that's around us. No, no, no. God uses means to keep us. What are some of the means that he uses? Well, he uses the regular reading of God's word. It transforms and renews us, our mind, our thinking. When we pray, we spend time to him. And when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. That's what the scriptures say. It can be through the regular, week by week, sitting under the preaching of the word of God. How he reminds you and he restores you and he strengthens you. It could be the Christian songs you listen to and they have vital truth. And again, it helps you endure that week. Can I suggest to you there's another way that God keeps us in his hand? And that is through Christian friendship. Friendship. This morning, well in Proverbs, and again, we have to get absolutely right from the start. When we open the book of Proverbs, we're opening a book not like the other books. This is not an epistle. This is not a letter. This is not historical narrative, a story. What we have in Proverbs is wisdom literature, wisdom for living. So you read Proverbs, and it will talk to you about handling money. It'll talk to you about marriage and parenting. It'll talk to you about sexuality. It'll talk to you about character and work ethic. This morning, one of the wonderful things it talks about is friendship. That's what I want us to look at this morning. Friendship and how important God says it is. Maybe we don't hear much about this. So would you bear with me just for a moment and then we'll dive into this uh, passage together. Father, we thank you for this time that we have now to open your word. Um, Lord, there are no pages in the scriptures that are irrelevant and that are unprofitable. As Andrew had said earlier, the word of God is living and active. God, may we experience it this way this morning. Lord, what you have to say for us from your word, Lord, may we receive it wholeheartedly. Lord, may we be opened up and say, God, speak. We're listening. Talk to me from the pages of Scripture. I'm here to to listen to you. And God, may we be resolved to obey and to respond to this same word. Lord, every step of the way through this passage, point us to Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, if you're taking notes this morning, we're, we're talking about friendship. We're talking about the friendship that God delights in, that he wants for us. So our first uh, point this morning, the heaven-sent friend will rebuke you of sin. The heaven-sent friend will rebuke you of sin. Look at verse 5. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now, two, word, two key words there in that verse, better and the word then. Better than. Now, God also says here there's two actions. One of the actions is beneficial for your life, and one of them is unprofitable for your life. Look at the two actions in the verse. Open rebuke and hidden love. Now, open rebuke, what is this? This is confronting someone about their sin. This is calling out sin for what it is. It is correcting someone by pointing out something in their life that isn't pleasing to God. Now look how open rebuke is contrasted. It's contrasted with hidden love. Now what is hidden love as a a contrast here? Hidden love is failing to speak, failing to confront, seeing sin and yet being unwilling to speak up in the moment. Again, do you know the contrast? One friend is open, it says, and another friend is hidden, is closed. One opens and speaks, one is closed and remains silent. Hidden love is a refusal to do what is right, to to, to not speak up. You know, this is is sinful. This is sin actually masquerading as love. You know, when someone will say, I love them too much to bring them up, uh, to bring this up with them. 
I love them too much to have to say anything about this. That is deception. It is deception. And, and what, what is that? It stems from selfishness and cowardice, right? Because when we won't speak up, we're saying it's too uncomfortable. It, it's, not, it's not pleasant. And we fear losing our reputation. And we fear what it may cost us if we try and help that person. What will they say about me? What will happen? This, this unsettles the nice calm waters that I love to cruise along. Now, please hear me here. I understand rebuking is not one of our favorite things. And if I can be absolutely honest, rebuking is one of my least favorite things in the world. Honestly, it is so much easier for me in love to preach a strong, hard, and confronting message from behind the pulpit than to have to go up to someone and confront them face to face because they need to be rebuked. It is. It absolutely is. But but God says this is love. This is love. 2 Timothy 4, 2, it tells us part of our calling. Listen, preach the word, be ready in season and out, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, that's a responsibility of elders there. But this is also the calling for all of us. What does Jesus say in Luke 17, 3? Pay attention to yourselves. If your fellow brother sins, rebuke him. This, to do this, is love. This is how Jesus loves his church. Do you remember when he writes to the church at Laodicea in Revelation and he calls them out on their practices and he hurts them so much? But what does Jesus say, verse 19 in Revelation 3? Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. It's Jesus. This is what God does with his people, doesn't he? Proverbs 3.11, My son, do not despise the discipline of the Lord or loathe his rebuke. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Is this what he does? Now, we all know one of arguably the most famous verses in the Bible, right? Leviticus 19.18, Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus picks up on that and quotes in the New Testament. But do we know the verse that directly precedes that verse? Leviticus 19.17 says this, You may certainly rebuke your neighbor. So verse 17, you may rebuke your neighbor. Verse 18, love them as yourself. You see what God's doing? He's retraining our thinking of what love actually is. Rebuking is love. We must recognize the times that we're living in. We must, because we are indoctrinated by the media, by television, by radio, by podcasts, by video, by TV shows, and, and we, are, we are pressed with this decree that they put upon us, that to rebuke, to challenge, to confront and correct, that is unloving. That is unloving. That's hateful. That's hate speech. You need to affirm everyone. How dare you say as a man that I'm not entitled to marry another man? How dare you say that I don't have the right to change the gender on my birth certificate? How dare you say that I can't leave my unhappy marriage? How dare you say that my belief system is incorrect? How dare you? And you might be thinking, Nathan, you know, that's right. It is terrible out there, and that's exactly what they're saying. I say to you, Christians are doing the same thing now. They are. Christians are buying into an anti-rebuke and anti-correction culture. Think about it. How dare you say that I shouldn't be watching those kind of movies and shows? How dare you suggest that I allow my children to play video games too much? How dare you question my commitment to this congregation? How dare you say that I use too much of my money on worldly possessions? How dare you say that this life choice will affect me negatively spiritually? How dare you? And how dare you say that I'm neglecting my husband or my wife or my children spiritually? How dare you suggest that? There's no tolerance for rebuking today. Yet God says it's essential. Now look how he ties it into friendship. Look at verse 6, right? Look what he says, verse 6. 
Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, verse 6 illustrates the point of verse 5. So verse 6, he now presents again two people with two different actions. Look at the two different people that you see there. There again, another contrast. You have a friend and you have an enemy. There's the two people. And now look at the two actions. One faithfully wounds you. And what does the other one do? They multiply kisses. So you have this contrast between a friend and an enemy and wounds and kisses. Now, these faithful wounds, what's that? He's just told us in verse 5. Faithful wounds is picking up on the image of rebuking. Wounds wounds here are a picture of the pain that we feel when someone rebukes us of our sin, right? It hurts. It opens us up wide because it hits close to home. You're not talking about sin in general where we all say, amen, amen, that's wrong. You're talking about it in my life. And we're opened up. But friends, we know that wounds are not always a bad thing, don't we? Picture the nurse who walks into a hospital room and she sees a fairly new patient there and half of his head is covered in bandages and it's still saturated with blood. And she says to the patient, my goodness, that must be a giant wound there. And the patient says, yes, it's bigger than I ever imagined. But I'm thankful for it because it saved my life. I had brain cancer. And she picks up and looks at the child and says, oh, I see. I see. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. A godly friend will say what an acquaintance would be too afraid or timid to say. A godly friend is so, has love that's so deep. They risk offense. They risk being misunderstood. They risk what it might cost them. A godly friend, they can't wink at sin. They can't do that. A godly friend knows the power of sin. They know the sting of sin. And they know the deception of sin. And so they want to help you. A godly friend, they want your best. A godly friend, they want to see you grow into Christ's likeness. A godly friend wants God to be glorified through your life. A godly friend knows that the end of the sinful road only leads to misery and destruction and they cannot sit back idly or you head to destruction. They can't do it. And so we say, yes, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful. And look at their contrast. I mean, look at the imagery. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, in the Hebrew there, that word profuse, it can mean excessive or abundant, many. But that Hebrew word for profuse can also mean deceitful. So a friend who doesn't speak up and doesn't rebuke, this friend who won't rebuke the sin in your life, what do they do? They don't speak up about your sin. They just kiss it better. They kiss it better. What are they doing? They're telling you exactly what your flesh wants to hear. That's what they're doing. You, you know, when someone opens up to you, and, and this is this is all of us. I think this is a natural instinct. Someone opens up and they're just saying, "You know what? I just, I, I'm just far from the Lord. I, I can't be bothered reading my Bible. I can't be bothered praying. I'm happy to miss gathering on Sundays. I just, I'm not teaching my kids. I'm not evangelizing to anyone. What's a natural instinct that we want to do? It's okay. We're all like that. We, we all do that." We all struggle with sin. You know what's better? Just be quiet for a second. Don't say anything. Hold your tongue and just nod and say, yeah, it's not good. It's not good. What are we going to do about it? Because God doesn't want this and it doesn't please him. Stop and just pause for a second. Instead of trying to kiss it all better and kiss it away. See, the the so-called friend who just does that, they're not a friend to your soul. Proverbs is so strong, says they're not friends, they're actually enemies to your soul. What do I need from my friend? From my friend? I have said to them, listen, if you see me driving to a, towards a cliff, don't tell me what a great driver I am. If you see me neglecting my wife, don't tell me what a wonderful husband I am. If you see me becoming proud and conceited and unteachable, then don't say, yeah, but at least he has a good heart. 
If you see me sleeping in a building and the next level has flames in it, don't say, yeah, well, he needs his rest. Don't do that. If you see an idol in my life, don't say, yes, but his love for Jesus is so passionate. Don't do that. If you see your friend in sin, don't blow them a kiss. Let Judas pretend he loves us with his kiss, but let me receive the faithful wound of a friend who will speak. I hope you want the same. What's God doing? He is retraining our thinking, right? We normally associate wounds with enemies, and we normally associate kisses with friends. But when it comes to sin, that's not the case. It's not. The one who's willing to wound in love, that's the, that's the true friend. That's the true friend. And can I just add this to it? This is part of our calling, but let the rebuke be done with all gentleness, with all humility, with all care and careful consideration. You make sure you go into it prayed up, knowing that you're a sinner before God as well, and that there is a fountain of grace for sinners. That's how we do it. Well, secondly, this morning, note the heaven-sent friend will restore you with counsel. They will restore you with counsel. Look at verse 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. In, in, in that context, oil and, and perfume, they were both applied to the body. Both of them, oil was applied to the head when someone had been on a long journey and it would be refreshing, no air conditioning, right? It would be refreshing for a long journey. And perfume was put on the clothes and on the garments. Why? Because, yeah, they struggled with sweat too. And these two things, oil and perfume, they would refresh, they would bless, they were pleasant, they would delight. They blessed the person. Verse 9, they make the heart glad. Oil and perfume are wonderful gifts from God. And then what does it say? Okay, you see these beautiful gifts? A friend is like oil and perfume. Okay? And he says, the sweetness of a friend. So what is the sweetness that marks a precious friend? What is the sweetness that marks him? He tells us, look at verse 9. The sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. You see that, see that phrase here? Earnest counsel. That means heartfelt counsel. Counsel from the very depths. That's what that word means there. Why is this true sweetness? Because it is heartfelt. They're earnest with you. They're counseling you in a way that they would want to be counseled if they were in that situation. What are they doing to you? They're fulfilling the second greatest command. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's from the heart. They are loving you. Earnest counsel, we see that in Hebrews 3, 12 to 13, right? When some when brothers and sisters are in sin, what does it say? Hebrews 3, 12 to 13, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily. There's danger, and I'm going to encourage you in the right way and show you the right way. This is true friendship. You know, you, you go to a friend and you tell them, I'm just flat, I'm struggling, life's too busy, God is normally up here, but just because of life, God is down here at the moment, and my marriage is withering away, and all my other friendships are withering. I'm not reading, I'm not praying. What do you need in a friend when you say that? You need someone who's not just going to let you lick your wounds. Truly. Not someone who's just going to feel sorry for you. You need a friend who will listen and listen and keep their mouths shut while they listen to the fullness of the story and everything that's going on. And then what do you need? You need a friend who will give you earnest counsel, who will speak and they will tell you the Lord sees and the Lord knows. And they will take your eyes off the circumstances and turn your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will show you this is the way in which you are to walk. And we're heading here with you. This is what pleases God. This displeases God. They urge you. They exhort you. They plead with you. They say, are you busy? Open your Bible even more. Is life demanding? Then frequent the throne of grace every single day. 
all the more they'll plead with you not to withdraw. Don't step back. Don't pull back. That's the devil's bait. Do you get your life in order? No, they'll say, keep singing with God's people. Keep listening to God's word. Keep hearing it preached. Keep having fellowship. Keep praying together with your brothers and sisters. They'll urge you on. Earnest counsel. This is deeply practical. They will give you instruction regarding your relationship, regarding your parenting, regarding your work, regarding your time usage, regarding your money usage, regarding your priorities. And let me ask this. When is our counsel truly like oil and perfume to another friend? When? When is our friendship when, when are we full of sweetness to another? Our counsel is sweet when we are closest to the Lord Jesus. It is. When you have been communing with him and spending time with him, that is when your counsel will be the sweetest. When you have been opening up his word, when you pick up the Bible, and every single day you are gathering manna from the word, and so then when a need arises, you have a whole bag full of manna stored up to share. Alas, how many people do not gather manna from the Lord daily. And so then when crisis comes and a friend comes, they go to speak with them and they reach into the well, but there's no water there. And they go and reach for grain, but there's nothing been stored in the barn house because they have not gathered our counsel is sweet when we have been in the Word of God. The sweetness of a friend, you know, verse 9 is so beautiful because what did we say a friend does in verse 5 and 6? A friend rebukes. A friend opens us up with their words. But that's not all a friend does with their words. They open us up, but then they come with this healing balm of counsel. Yes, when they rebuked us, it went down like bitter herbs, but their counsel is like the sweetness of honey from the comb. That's what it does. They wounded, but they burn each other. This is that beautiful verse in Ecclesiastes 4 9, isn't it? Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. That's it, right? We need this friend who picks us up, who gives us truth when we need it, and points us in the right path. We need the friend who sees when we don't see. We need the friend who is strong when we are weak. That's what we need. Isn't that what David needed with Jonathan? David is overwhelmed and he is almost decimated because Saul keeps trying to kill his life. And what does Jonathan do? The king's son comes up to him and in 1 Samuel 23, 16, it says these words, Jonathan went to David at Horash and helped him find strength in God. In God. David was weak and shaken, and Jonathan talked to him about the Lord and strengthened him in God. This is the sweetness of a friend with his earnest counsel. A very old Christian from centuries ago famously said these words, Friendship doubles our joy and halves our sorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Friendship doubles our joy and halves our sorrow. Do you have such a friend as that? Are you such a friend as that? Thirdly, this morning, we know the heaven-sent friend will remain with you through the fire. The heaven-sent friend will remain with you through the fire. Verse 10, we see the friend who is faithful and reliable. Look at verse 10. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Now, the day of your calamity, what's this imagery here? It's a day when crisis comes and hits your life. Your house has been destroyed by the flood. Your house has been destroyed by the fire. You've lost things. A relationship has completely come crashing down. This is the day of your calamity. It's terrible news. Now, in such a day, you need help. What do you need? What should you do? What shouldn't you do on the day of calamity? When you're in trouble, verse 10, don't forsake your friend or your father's friend. Now, in the time of trouble, what's the natural instinct that we do? He tells us in verse 10, going to your brother's house 
in the day of your calamity. You see that? We seek out, when we're in trouble, we seek out the aid of a relative. That's normal. That's natural. That makes sense. Of course, it's family. But the wisdom of God says, don't go first to your brother's house. It's not always the wisest option. Why not? Well, there's a couple of reasons here. And one example that he gives is a geographical reason. Look at verse 10. He fleshes this out. Verse 10, better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. So now the friend is called a, a neighbor. That's how close they are. And your friend lives close by, but your relative, your brother, lives far away. So if you're in an immediate crisis, who's the best person to go to? The friend who is close nearby or the relative who lives in another state or is hours away? It's, it's the friend, right? That makes sense. But verse 10, I don't think it's simply talking about geography here. Which one lives closest to you? You know, better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. I don't think that's talking about kilometers. Near and far isn't just physical distance. Near and far is referring to spiritual and relational proximity. Better is a friend who is close in spirit and heart than a relative or a brother who is miles away in spirit and in heart. We see this principle right throughout the Bible, don't we? Joseph, his own brothers hated and despised him and sold him into slavery. But it's Potiphar in Egypt who takes him out of slavery and brings him into his own home. We, we see this also with David. His own brothers despise him. Remember David and Goliath battle, all the brothers were in the army, and they say, get lost, what are you doing here? You're rascal, get away. And they're callous towards their brother. And yet it's the king's son who shows David great love. We even see this principle in our Lord Jesus' life. You read Mark 3 and John chapter 7, and it says his own brothers, his siblings, thought he was out of his mind and thought he was absolutely crazy. And yet it was a bunch of misfit disciples who loved and adored him. You see, relatives are not always closer than the genuine loving friend. Proverbs always speaks to this. The true friend may be closer than relatives. Listen to Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. See, this, this happens so often. There is a great difference between a friend and a relative. When trouble hits... A brother or a relative, they have a biological obligation to help you, right? It's this kind of unspoken law regarding family. If you're in trouble, it's the family's responsibility to help. That's what family's for. That's what family is there. They're born into it. They don't necessarily choose that role. They're born into it. But this is what makes a friend so special. They love you, not because they had to. Because, but they've chosen to. They care for you, not because they were born into the relationship, because they've chosen to care for you, though. A friend sticks with you, not because of blood ties, but because of heart ties. And they meet with you. And so they'll walk the highs and the lows with you. And they'll enjoy the mountaintop with you, but they'll also endure the valley with you. They chose to be there by your side. They weren't born into it. It's said of all the fictional tales that have ever been written. This fictional tales, one of the greatest stories of friendship is argued that it's in Lord of the Rings. That this is the great story of friendship. You have that main character who's young, Frodo, and he's entrusted with a ring, an evil ring, a powerful ring that must be destroyed. And his mission is to go into the most dangerous place on the planet because that's the only place it can be destroyed. And so he's commissioned to go, but it's too difficult to go by himself. And so his friend, Samwise Genji, goes with him. He accepts the mission to accompany him. And together they go on their journey and they face war. They face enemies. Darkness surrounds them. It's all against them. And they experience terrible suffering, loss. They have to bury friends. Along the way, at times, the ring, this evil ring is so powerful, it takes over Frodo, 
He wants to give up. He loses hope. He's paralyzed in his thinking, in his body, and he can't go on. And worse than that, the ring even makes him turn against his best friend, treat him like an enemy. And yet Sam sticks by his friend, risks his life for him, speaks hope to him, and then you have that famous quote, hope is lost, things are impossible, and he says this to Pharaoh. I made a promise, Mr. Pharaoh. I said to myself, don't you leave him, Samwise Genji, and I don't mean to. I can't carry that ring for you, but I can carry you. J.R. Tolkien, after he wrote the books, was interviewed, and he said with his own mouth that the narrative is full of Christian themes, and maybe the strongest is biblical friendship. Biblical friendship. This is the friend of Proverbs. They know that we're on a perilous journey and that there are temptations and there's persecutions and there's a devil out there who's a roaring lion who wants to devour us. And so what do they do? They stick by us. Hebrews 3.13 Exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. What do they do? They stick by you and they urge you on. Pharaoh had sand. Moses had Aaron, David had Jonathan, Paul had Luke. We need friendship. What did he say in that Proverbs we just read? A friend loves at all times. At all times. And back in verse 10 it says, do not forsake that friend. Don't forsake your friend or your father's friend. How faithful is this friend? They've been faithful over two generations. They were faithful to your father and they've been faithful to you. Don't let that go. Don't let that friend go. Well, we've seen this morning the heaven sent friend will rebuke you of sin, will restore you with counsel, will remain with you through fire. And just lastly, this morning, the heaven sent friend will refine your faith and character. They'll refine your faith and character. Now we come to perhaps the most well-known verse in in Proverbs, verse 17, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Now, the imagery is so striking, isn't it, right? When When they would forge swords and refine and sharpen swords, they'd take that iron sword and they would rub it against other iron, another piece of iron. And the friction, the abrasion would bring great heat and it would refine and make it sharper. And here, that act is compared to what friends do with one another. They sharpen one another just as iron sharpens iron. They refine one another. Now, how does that refining happen? How does the sharpening happen? It comes through dialogue. It comes through discourse. It comes through conversation. It's being with a friend and talking about God, talking about doctrine, talking about theology, talking about the scriptures, Do you remember Jesus after he rose from the dead? In Luke 24, he's walking on the road with a couple of disciples to Emmaus. They don't know it's Jesus. And what does he do? He takes the Bible as it were, which is stored up in his head, and he goes through the Old Testament, right through the whole thing, and shows them how the whole Bible has said that the Messiah must suffer and die. When they get to the place of meeting, they finally realized the man was Jesus that was talking to them. Now, notice the language. Notice the friction. Notice the heat of their interaction. Listen to the wording. They say this, 24 verse 32, and they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures to us? Did not our hearts burn? There was friction. Jesus was iron. They were iron. And he spoke to them about the word. And he said, we were burning within. They were being refined. Let me tell you, even as elders of the church here, we are working on this. We're meeting twice a month. Why? We're reading a Christian book together about God's word, about teaching in God's word, so that we can sharpen one another and refine one another and grow with one another. And I hear from the congregation that some of you are meeting together to read together so that you might sharpen one another and be refined. And it's what we're doing in our Bible studies. This is what it's about. How else do friends sharpen one another? They don't just talk about theology, but they talk about how the theology and the Word of God is being worked out in their life. 
they start getting practical. They talk about their walk with Christ. They talk about their temptations and their struggles and how they fall short. But they also talk about the things they're putting in place to overcome. They talk about their habits. They talk about what they're reading in the Bible. They talk about their prayer disciplines. They talk about how they lead their children every single day in family worship. And then what begins to happen? The other person that they're sharing with, the heart starts to burn. And they start feeling this friction. And as they do, by the way, they're saying, I want to talk more about God. I want to talk more about the Word. I want to talk more about this and how it can be part of my life and how I can do what you're doing and how I can get closer to Christ. I want my marriage to be like that. I want my children to see that and know that. I want that happening in my workplace. I want to be equipped like that. This is what happens. We are not just made for friendship. We are made by our friendships. Right? This is what says Proverbs 30 and 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. Iron sharpens iron. Our friends make us and refine us. They really do. So let me close. We have that wonderful promise that we mentioned at the start that no one will snatch the genuine Christian from Christ's hand and no one will snatch us out of the Father's hand. But friendship, Christian friendship, is one of the means that God uses to strengthen us and to keep us for the entirety of our pilgrimage towards heaven. Christian friendship is just that. You might be thinking this morning, you know what, I hear everything you're saying, Nathan, about friendship, but guess what? It doesn't work. Because I had a friend like the one you described this morning. I had a wonderful Christian friend, but what was sweet soon became sour, and what was beautiful became terribly ugly, and what was so strong completely crumbled, and I was shattered. They walked away. Let me say to you, never forget from the Scriptures, friendship is not God's solution. It's his gift. Friendship is not God's perfect solution. It's his gift to us. Listen very carefully. Proverbs 18.24 A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You may have many good friends, but you may still come to ruin. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Who is this friend? 2 Timothy Paul. Paul signs off. He's going to die. And Paul says, I had my trial. And all my friends, Caesar was furious and his anger was hot against the church. And all my missionary friends, they panicked. And when I was on trial, they all left me. But look what he says, 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but they all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the friend of friends. He left heaven so that we could come to heaven. He became a man so that he could save man. He was wounded so that we would be healed. And this friend, he says, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. And he walks up Calvary, and he goes there, and he is forsaken by God so that we might be welcomed by God. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He was cursed so that we would be blessed. He died so that we might live forever. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the friend of friends, and he is the friend of sinners, and his name is Jesus Christ. Christian friendship is not the solution, it's a gift. Jesus Christ is the one who abides and remains. Friends may move and leave and live far away, but Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Friends change, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. Do you know him? You might be going through a patch and saying, I haven't got any of these Christian friends. You call on the name of the Lord. He is right there. He is right there. And he will provide for you.
He will provide for you. This is Christian friendship. That stems from the friendship we have with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we we give you praise. Lord, your word uh, doesn't just talk about the church or the second coming, but Lord, it talks about deeply personal and significant aspects of our life, even friendship. Lord, we thank you for the friendship that your word highlights a a manual for, for Christian friendship, who we are to look, who we should be looking for in a friend, what we should be looking for. God, I pray for those of us who do not have this Christian friend that's described in Proverbs, may you graciously provide for our good and for our growth, for our endurance. And Lord God, I pray for those who are in the congregation who do have a friend that is described here in this passage. God, may you fill them with gratitude. Fill them with thankfulness to you for your good gift. And may they hold on to that friendship tightly. Lord, we pray that you would bless us in these things. Keep us going. Lord, help us to grow, we pray, until we reach the final destination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.